it's in our message series called Shine the Light. Uh, in this series, we've been challenging ourselves to find ways to shine the light in our world. We want to do that for a couple of reasons. First, we want to be obedient to our Lord and Savior. And then we do it because the light of God's truth is so desperately needed in our world today. The key scripture for this series comes from Matthew 5, where Jesus says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. So for several weeks now, we've been talking about shining the light and doing good deeds. So now maybe it's a good time to ask, how are you doing with that? Are you finding practical ways to shine the light each week? Are you keeping your eyes open and looking for opportunities to shine the light? How would you do if you were back in high school and the teacher asked you to turn in your homework from the past week, showing what you did this past week to shine the light? Would you turn in a paper filled with some really good examples of what you did? Or would you turn in a paper that is blank and you'd ask for more time? What would it be? You know, this isn't just something for us to think about. God wants us to do this. Jesus didn't tell us to shine the light so we'd have something nice to think about or some fun songs to sing. Jesus wants us to put our faith in action. You will have opportunities every day to shine the light, so make sure you're taking advantage of those opportunities. In Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul writes this, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place in God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of light. So let's be clear on what the Apostle Paul is saying and what he's not saying. Paul described all these things that take place in the darkness, things like sexual immorality and greed, obscene stories and coarse jokes. Is Paul saying, hey, you need to stay away from people that do stuff like that? No, absolutely not. Why would we stay away from them if we hope to reach them for Jesus Christ? Those people who do those things are people who are loved by God. And Jesus died on the cross to reach them. How will we ever reach them with God's love if we choose to not have any contact with them? We need to follow the example of Jesus. You'll remember that Jesus was criticized by who? the religious people for hanging out with the wrong kind of people. But Jesus told them it's the sick people who need a doctor, not the healthy. So what the Apostle Paul is saying in verse 7 is this. He says, don't participate in the things those people do. Don't participate in the sexual immorality or the obscene stories or the coarse jokes. And by the way, did you notice which sin he mentioned the most in the scripture? Greed. Three times he talks about greed or the greedy person. So maybe we need to be examining our hearts to make sure we're not being greedy with the blessings that we have in life. So Paul's teaching is not saying we should stay away from people who do bad things. Instead he says, don't participate in the things they are doing. Verse 8 says, you have the light from the Lord, so live as people of light. The Apostle Paul's echoing the teaching of Jesus, where Jesus told his followers to shine the light. 
How will lost people ever be saved if Christians aren't shining the light? Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The church has been given the same mission. So the question becomes for us, how can we live as people of light? How can we live as people of light? And as you think about your life, what practical things can you do to live as a person of light? Do you have some things that come to your mind right now? God wants me to live as a person of light. So what practical things can I do to be a person of light? I'd say think about your phone for a second. Can you use your phone to be a person of light? Can you call and visit someone who might be lonely? Can you send an encouraging text message to a friend who might be struggling? I think there are so many things that we can do to live as a person of light. And I want to start with something that might surprise you when I say this. Don't go charging into this unprepared, but wait. And now you're probably confused. <laughs> you're probably thinking, well, you just told me to go shine the light in practical ways. Now you're telling me to wait. I don't get it. Well, to understand this, I want to go back to the example of Jesus. Jesus told his followers to shine the light. But then he told them to wait. So let's look at the scripture in Acts chapter 1. The setting is that Jesus has already died on the cross for his sins. God raised him from the dead. Jesus appeared to many different groups of people. Now he's meeting with his followers. He's teaching them some last things now before he goes back to heaven. Acts 1 verse 3. After his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. So why would Jesus tell him to wait? Every minute counts. There's lost people who need to be saved. Why in the world do we need to wait? Well, you find out why they need to wait in verse 8. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is saying, you need to wait, because the Holy Spirit is going to come on you, and he's going to give you the power to do what? The power to be my witnesses. The power to shine the light. That's why you need to wait. Don't ever make the mistake of trying to do this in your own power or in your own strength. God is telling us the batteries in my flashlight are going to last way longer than the batteries in your flashlight. So don't try to do this on your own. All right? And don't we know that from personal experience? Yeah. Let's be clear on something. Our good deeds are done in His power and for His glory. That's always got to be the way we approach it. Our good deeds are done in His power and for His glory. Every day, we think about shining the light. We need to be praying, Lord, how can I rely on Your power today to shine the light wherever it's needed? That's the question we should be asking so after telling you to wait, I think the next important step is this. Do whatever it takes to stay connected to Jesus. Do whatever it takes to stay connected to Jesus. Just as you need oxygen to breathe, you also need to stay connected to Jesus to accomplish anything that's going to be worthwhile. John 15, Jesus said, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them, they're going to produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you talk to any pastors you know who are in the full-time ministry, they would probably tell you of times in their life when they felt so totally inadequate 
to do the job that God was calling them to do. I get those episodes quite often in my life, and to be honest, it's a terrible feeling. But I'm thankful that those episodes come because they're needed in my life and in my ministry. They're needed because they remind me that I am totally inadequate by myself. My strength alone is never going to accomplish anything of lasting value. But when I allow God's power to work through me, then good things can happen. And that's not a one-time life lesson. That's a lesson that is taught over and over and over again. This past week, I read a story that a man named Pastor Wolf told about his life. He told of a time that he was called to a hospital bedside of an elderly woman to offer final prayers before she passed away. He took her hand, but he said he felt like a fraud. He wondered who was he to shepherd a person into eternity. But in obedience, he prayed for this woman before she passed away. And then when he was talking to his wife about what had happened at the hospital and how he felt so inadequate, she said to him, you're right, you are unworthy. And when I was reading his story, I stopped right there and I thought, boy, isn't she a bundle of encouragement. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to be married to her? <laughs> but listen to what she went on to say. She said, you are unworthy. Anyone would be unworthy to do something like that. But that's okay because it's not you doing it. It's being done through you. And Pastor Wolf said, that was a pivotal moment for me. Suddenly it became clear to me that we bring light into this world, not as the source, but as a prism. The light comes through us. Just as electricity requires a conduit, so the Holy Spirit moves through Christians to touch others in crucial moments. So I like what he said, the power to do good deeds and to shine the light, that power comes from God. Edith Wharton had a similar idea when she said this. She said there's two ways of spreading the light. You can be the candle, or you can be the mirror that reflects it. We can't be the candle because Jesus is the candle, but we can be and we must be the mirrors who reflect the light of Jesus. Isn't that an interesting angle on that? Jesus is the light of the world, and if she's right when she compared us to a mirror, then it's our job to polish up the mirror, we clean up the smudges and the water spots so that we can clearly reflect God's light into the world. Robert Fulgham wrote a book called, I love this title, It Was on Fire When I Laid Down on It. In that book, he tells a story about Alexander Papadouros. Papadouros was a teacher of Greek culture. He was a politician on the island of Crete next to the mass graves of the Germans and the Cretans who fought each other bitterly in World War II. Papadouros has founded an institute for peace which has become the source of bridge building between these two countries. I'd say that's pretty important. So what kind of vision motivated him to take the focus off himself and dedicate his life to that compassion and that peace? This is what he said. He said, when I was a small child during the war, we were poor and we lived in a remote village. One day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place I kept a large piece of the broken mirror, and then by scratching it on some stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy. And I became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect the light into dark places where the sun would never shine. 
I could reflect the light into deep holes and dark closets. It became a game for me to get the light into the hardest to reach places that I could find. So I kept that little mirror, and as I grew older, I would take it out in idle moments and I'd continue the challenge of this game. And then as I became an adult, I grew to understand that this was a metaphor for what I could do with my life. I came to understand that I'm not the light or the source of the light. I can reflect the light into dark places of the world and change a few things in people, and then perhaps others may see, and they might do likewise. So isn't that interesting? He finds a broken mirror, plays a childhood game. Boy, I want to see the hardest to reach places where I can reflect the light and get it in there. And then that becomes his life mission. And it led him to start an institute for peace where soldiers who once fought each other, now the countries are building bridges of peace. Wow. What about you and me? Do you know of some dark, hard-to-reach places where we need to reflect the light of God's love? When we see people in our world stumbling around in darkness, making terrible choices for themselves, for their families, we need to stay on mission. We need to reflect the light of Jesus to help them. So as you think of how to apply today's message, I would encourage you to set aside some time each day where you simply wait on the Lord. You wait and you pray. And you remind yourself of how much you need his power. Just as the early church did in the book of Acts, you're going to wait because you want God's spirit to guide you you want God's Spirit to give you strength. Our good deeds are done in His power and for His glory. And then you do whatever it takes to stay connected to Jesus Christ. I think you can ask yourself these questions. First, what are you doing right now in your life that helps you stay connected to Jesus? Can you think of something? What are you doing right now in your life that helps you stay connected in a relationship to Jesus Christ? Is it your daily prayer? Is it Bible study? Is it meeting with Christian friends? Is it listening to Christian praise music? What are you doing right now that helps you stay connected to Jesus Christ? But then we also need to ask this question. What are you doing in your life right now that might weaken your connection? Are you doing some things that you need to stop doing because it's hurting your walk with Jesus Christ? You know, Satan loves to whisper in your ear. He's going to say things like, you know, it's no big deal. Looking at pornography is not that big a deal. So I'm just going to find out. Or maybe Satan whispers in your other ear. Hey, you know, you deserve nice things. Go ahead and buy it. I wouldn't really say you're being greedy. Just view it as a reward that you deserve for all your hard work. And it's no big deal if your credit card debt keeps getting bigger. Just make the minimum payments. You're going to be fine. If you're doing something that's hurting your walk with the Lord, then you need to stop doing those things. Because we've been called to live as children of light. Imagine a few of you have been watching the Olympics this past week. I read that the Greeks had a race in their Olympic Games that was unique. The winner was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. So no matter how you run the race that God has called you to run, make sure you finish with your torch still lit because we are to shine the light until our dying breath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of reflecting, reflecting the light of Jesus Christ to our world. You have changed our lives with your light 
And now, Lord, help us to shine the light so that other people can experience what you can do in their life as well. I pray that they will experience joy and peace and hope and love and every good gift that you have for them. So help us to be faithful and shine the light wherever it's needed. We do it in your power and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.